Hi everyone. Welcome to the fourth video in my series on micro front ends using module federation. In the video today, we're going to look at using build time remotes versus dynamic remotes. We're going to look at using the shared feature of module federation, basically how to share modules between your micro front ends. We'll also talk a little bit about versioning your remotes. So in today's video, we're going to start with a recap of where we left off in our previous series. So we had this application that was basically uh, a storefront for selling t-shirts and the hero banner here at the top was essentially our micro front end. So this uh, top portion here with the image and the t-shirt, um, basically on a smaller screen, it'll hide. So let's take, a, let's take a quick look at the network tab when we actually load up this page. I'm gonna sort by URL. You'll notice that our host application is running on 4200 and our micro front end is running on 3001. So you can see the requests here and the requests make up all of the dependencies of our actual module, right? So if we go over and we look at our code and we look at the module federation config, let's pull up one for our hero project and this is the actual micro front end. It's exposing this product hero module. And again, this, this is mapping to an internal, basically a component inside of React, and that's what we're exposing out. Now, when we go back here, you'll notice that you'll see this remote entry file again. You'll, you'll see the kind of various components of whatever makes up this module. Now, when you, when you build your application with the module federation plugin, what it's going to do is it's going to take your exposed file, find all the dependencies, and basically create a module map and this module map is what's actually used in this remote entry file. So if we go to this remote entry file and we just visit it directly, we can actually go in here and see there's a, uh, a variable created within this file called module map. You'll see our product hero module here. And it'll basically map to all of the various chunks and dependencies for the module we're exposing. Uh, and the way they're loaded is through Webpack require. When this runs, this will automatically go and make that network request to request those additional dependencies for whatever you're importing. Now, the remote entry file does contain, um, in this case, I'm running in dev mode, so some of my, um, my bundles are larger. But the remote entry file will contain eager loaded shared modules as well. We'll talk a little bit more about shared modules here in a minute. The one thing to note, though, is that none of this requirement of uh, dependencies is done explicitly, right? So in your application, if we go to our consuming component, you'll see we have a simple import statement here where we import the hero module and then the product hero uh, module from within it. So the product hero uh, component that we're exposing in this case, this is all seamlessly handled by module federation. Now, how does it really know how to get this? How does it know how to resolve this module, in other words? So we know that in our previous video, we created a mock module here for the product hero. We'll talk a little bit about TypeScript too in this video as well. So in this uh, mock module here, we could go and we could make this uh, a little bit more robust and we could provide some hand-rolled typings for our module, that's definitely an option as well. But the way that this gets resolved, so if you look inside of our um, main JS file coming from our shell, you'll actually see that the URL to this remote file is, is actually bundled within our application. So we would call this, or I would call this, a build or a static remote, right? It's a remote that would require the shell or the consumer uh, to be rebuilt in order for this URL to change. Now, in this case, we're using NX. Um, so if we go into our module federation config, NX is looking up this project called Hero within its project graph. It's grabbing its Webpack configuration and it's discovering which port it's hosted on. And that's how it's able to get that URL. Now, in normal Webpack in the Module Federation plugin or in NX, you can configure this to hit a URL, right? It's, you know, you could configure this, build it, and that URL will be within your bundle. 
Now, the downside of that is, again, you're kind of locked when you want to version that remote. When, you know, you're essentially publishing out a new version, you also have to publish out your consumer, right? If you want to consume that new version. So there's some downsides of that configuration. And let's talk a little bit about remote versioning. So if you look at, you know, your, your source code today, if you pretend that this is your repo, you have some branch that you're committing to, you know, there's a number of things that you could run uh, different triggers on, right? So if you're using GitHub, um, you know, this could be a merge, it could be a pull request, it could be a release that you create. There's a number of different ways to handle it. But essentially in those, uh, let's say GitHub Actions, you have access to either the commit hash or, you know, maybe it's a version or a tag or something um, that's, that's on that particular commit. And then you can publish these artifacts out to a number of different places, right? It could be a simple, you know, Azure storage. It could be a um, Amazon S3 bucket. Uh, you could use Azure Static Web Apps. There's a number of different ways to host them. I highly suggest a CDN for these types of artifacts. Um, and if you think about what you're publishing, you're basically publishing your entire application. You're just gonna take the output of your you know, React app and you're just gonna deploy it out there. The way that I kind of recommend deploying it out there is you know, create some type of folder um, you know, in your storage container um, and then you could use the versions or the the uh, you know the tags or the commit hashes kind of as different subfolders, and you would deploy your you know application output into those folders. This should allow you to get kind of a fully qualified URL and a URL which is important here that changes with every deployment. So going back to this remote entry file that gets imported. If you think about, again, the contents of it, these are all the different modules that it's uh, you know, basically loading for you. So if this remote entry file was to be cached and these underlying modules change, it would break your application. So cache busting through a unique URL is, is the preference here. So when we go back here and we think about these build time remotes, how do we make them dynamic? Uh, there's there's a couple of ways to do that. There's a, a plugin, I believe, for Webpack that lets you use a, a window variable. Um, you can, you know, parameterize that in your build pipeline. There's also delegate modules. So delegate modules is another method of dynamically importing modules. Um, and then there's also a, uh, if you're in React, uh, and uh, Next.js also has similar support, there is a uh, package called the Module Federation Utilities Package. And in this package here, this is just the, the repo, um, there is a, uh, a federation boundary if you're using Next. And then in React, there's a, an import remote where you can go and you can import, um, you know, and you could, you could do uh, asynchronous requests out as well within this tool and, and you could fetch from a configuration service. So from a configuration service perspective, um, if you had a, a base URL that maybe had the, the module um, version in, within the path here, this would be a good, a good example. And I'll show an example of that here in a second. Um, and in an upcoming release, so this is kind of on latest here, it will have support for ESM modules as well. So right now, kind of the default build and Webpack's producing CommonJS. Uh, uh, NX is using by default ECMAScript modules. So if you're using ESM, if you're using NX, you're using ESM by default. Uh, there's currently an open ticket for NX to um, support this. And really the issue is more on the import remote side than NX, right? It needs to just be tolerant of that uh, module format. So let's go ahead and convert this over. So if we go in here, uh, we essentially, the first thing we need to do is we need to install the uh, module Federation Utilities um, package. So right now I have it installed and I just have it sim linked locally to latest so I can use that ESM feature here just as a demonstration. But once you install Utilities, you can go into your component. In this case, it's my home component here. And we're just gonna go ahead and import, import remote. Uh, and then I'll just comment out what I was using before. And basically, I'll uncomment the code that I had here. So right now, this looks pretty much identical. It's just instead of import, you're using this import remote method that's coming out of utilities. Uh, the input here is basically gonna be a URL. This is a string. It also takes a, a promise as well. Uh, so you can 
you know, do something like this here if you want. And the idea here is that, you know, you, you might have uh, maybe a format that looks like this. Um, you know, this could be from a configuration service again, right? So you kind of already know in this scope kind of what you're requesting. And, you know, you could use additional parameters such as, you know, a JOT token or something from the user that, you know, enables AB, um, you know, testing on here, different URLs, different versions. Um, there's, there's a lot of different capability here. Right now, we're not using that, so I'm just going to point it to my local host. Um, the scope parameter here, if you think about your import statement, these two lines here are just kind of breaking them apart. Uh, the scope is your remote container, your remote entry. The module is the, just the name of that kind of component that you're pulling in. Uh, the remote entry file. So this is just the um, default value for it. So I'm just specifying it here, remote entry JS. And I'm saying ESM true because, again, I'm using... NX. If I wasn't using NX or I'm not using ESM output on my Webpack config, I would just omit this. It's optional. And uh, basically, you'll you'll get you know normal functionality out of it. So with just this change here, if I go ahead and I serve my application again, and I go and I look, it's the, the same functionality as before, right? Nothing has changed. And uh, I can you know, reload this. Uh, sort by the domain and, and see that those those same files are coming from 3001. So this just gives us the ability to have a configurable or a you know kind of dynamic remote. Now this uh, is no longer part of our main bundle. Just to kind of prove a point here. So if I go in here, you know at the top here was this URL. This URL doesn't exist anymore. It's not not part of the the host application. Um, and if you you know, again, if you put this behind a fetch or something, you can go fetch this from some asynchronous source um, and you could change it at runtime, right? So every new request, you know, could go somewhere else. So this is a pretty, a pretty powerful feature and we could talk about some of the drawbacks here. <clears throat> so one of the things to consider is that uh, the module federation uh, module sharing feature does operate differently based on these kind of static build remotes or dynamic remotes. So I'm going to go into uh, my home component here and I'm going to log out something called webpack require uh, and then basically s. So if I run, run my application again, so if I run this application again and I go and look, I will just refresh, we'll pull up the console so when I expand this, you'll see a couple of properties here. One, the first property you'll see is this key called default. Uh, this is just the name of the default sharing scope. This is configurable, but again, this is the default. Um, and then you'll see these libraries here that are basically within my sharing scope. So within the default sharing scope, I have these modules. And if I expand it, you'll see pretty much the name of my module. You'd see this in like your package JSON. Uh, you'll see the version as well, what you would pretty much see in there as well. And then you'll see metadata about what is um, being loaded, right? So you'll see if it's eager. You'll see the name of the remote that put this module within the share scope. So um, it's uh, this is a, you know, kind of internal process within module federation. But if you're using build or static time remotes, remotes will be pulled in. And essentially, it'll negotiate package sharing. It'll choose who to consume packages from, and then it'll seal the scope, meaning that you know further remotes that are loaded can't contribute to the scope, right? So, you know, as an example, if you were sharing like React, you wouldn't want a module to come in down the road and just you know overwrite what's already been uh, you know basically given a consensus on which version we're loading, where is it coming from, how do I get it? So that's this is kind of the shared scope. This is a good way to kind of go in and you can look at, you know, what's loading what, where is it coming from. Uh, and there, there might be a better way to do it, but this is just kind of what I've been doing. So I'm going to go ahead and just remove that real quick. Now with dynamic remotes, the remote is not part of your build time package, which means when your application loads, it can't negotiate the shared scope, meaning that whatever your shell uh, or host application is sharing will be sealed within that scope. 
So if you load a new module, if it's not a direct match, so this is um, you know minor version of the package match, it will request an additional module. So one of the things to consider is that when I'm using a dynamic remote, I might have some additional requests because not all of my modules, they might not share the way that I intend them to. So NX handles sharing a little bit differently here. Um, a good resource is going out to the official Module Federation um, IO documentation. They talk a lot about the shared system, how it works, how to configure it, um, use cases for it. Um, I'm not trying to give a comprehensive guide on this. Documentation does a much better job at explaining everything. Um, and they give a lot of examples too, which is nice. So if we go in and we look at how NX handles things, and this is, again, if you look at the documentation or, you know, the Webpack docs, or if you're using this in Webpack, it's pretty much identical. NX just has some proprietary, you know, properties and configuration for it. The underlying concept's the same. So I'll go in the module federation config here for my, um, you know, my hero component. And the one thing to, to look at here is that in the, and I have JS doc enabled, so I have some types here. The shared property is actually a function. So if I come in and I look at this, it's gonna be something like, you know, library name and then config. And, and basically this is in the NX documentation as well. So NX has a module federation guide um, and it's got a section on sharing and how to configure it. And it's a little bit different but it kind of eagerly loads all your dependencies as a shared module, which, you know, if you're using NX, it, it, it uses that single version policy where, you know, at the root of your mono repo, you've got all of your dependencies. So the, the theory is, is that you're likely always on the same version across your micro front ends. Uh, this could potentially change, right? When you start talking about versioning, you could have an older module out there that's on a different version while your you know, newer modules have migrated within the mono repo or you know, across your repos in general. So the thing here is that we can actually disable this. We can just return false. It does have a section called additional shared. And we want to use just basically the same kind of configuration that we had before. So this is, uh, this is an array. And I'll just go ahead and paste this code snippet in. But it's, it's very close to what you would see with just kind of vanilla, you know, module federation. In this case, it just has an array and uh, you'll see the library name and then you'll see the shared config, which is kind of what you're already familiar with. And this is, uh, this is in my, my remote application. But I'm gonna share React, React DOM, and the JSX dev runtime. These are just all the pieces of uh, React. And, uh, and if I go into, let's say, my other module federation config, this is now in my host. Um, I'll actually just kind of paste this whole section here. So now at this point, we should be sharing pretty much the same thing across the board, right? We could, you know, import the package JSON and, you know, make this a little bit more dynamic, but um, this is pretty much the same, the same thing. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna rerun the application. The application's gonna come up. And if you noticed before, when we loaded this application, there were uh, several requests, different, different modules that were being loaded. Um, React was coming across as two different vendor bundles. And right now, React is being shared. So if I go in here, there'll be uh, React refresh in here, but this, this won't actually contain React. You can, you can see by the size here, React's like 30, 40 KB. Um, and then you can see our actual component 7 KB. So now sharing is actually kind of working correctly. And basically, you know, again, the sharing feature is documented out there. But the point of this is that, you know, I didn't really need to set anything as eager, even on the host side. You know, you can kind of leave eager out. Um, in most cases, just avoid it. Uh, you, you can enable it in your host or your consumer. But again, I would just try to avoid it. There's a lot of different configuration in here, so get familiar with the docs. And it starts kind of bringing us down the road of when we have a shared module, uh, what's, what's kind of the best way of handling it? 
Now, if again, if you're using kind of the single version policy approach, that's, in my opinion, a really good way of handling it. Again, I think there's a lot of benefits to the, the mono repo. Uh, if you're not, it's just something to be aware of, right? When you have dynamic remotes, remember, if these versions change, you will get additional requests and, you know, the users will be downloading additional modules. Uh, one other thing to cover is that with the Module Federation Utilities Library, so it does have a require path, uh, a node module, the node path module. So just make sure that in your Webpack config, you go in and you set a fallback and just set path to false. It won't, it won't hurt any kind of implementation on the React side. Um, it's a, uh, it's, it's another feature in there and it, it doesn't really have any impact. So again, just kind of give it a fallback. Um, let's talk about real quick, if you're using NX and you're, you're suffering from this module issue, there's currently a workaround documented on the official issue for it. Um, and it's basically just converting NX back to common JS modules and away from ESM. Uh, with the new feature, again, this isn't published yet, but it should be soon. Uh, this feature will just allow you to kind of use it without the without the workaround and you can kind of use NX just as is. Um, so just you know be on the lookout for that. The, the next thing to talk about here with modules, module versioning, and sharing is digging into TypeScript a little bit. So TypeScript is very interesting with how, again, it plays into kind of every piece here, right? So we have this module here. This module has basically no typing, right? So if I go in here and I look, it's just going to be any component type. React doesn't know. Um, so when I'm designing my components, and this isn't uh, meant to be a kind of definitive guide on how to design them, but uh, you know, your components might have props. They're going to have or could potentially have some kind of surface API area. That surface API area um, could change, right? So as you're versioning, um, having the right types could be really helpful, right? Now, having the mock module is just one way to approach it. Again, you can hand roll these types and make them more sophisticated. If you don't want to, there's a package. Let me go ahead and install that real quick. So I'll just you know pick a pick a spot here and I'll just kind of type it out. So it's uh, it's a little bit easier, but uh, you know module federation TypeScript. There is a native TypeScript as well, um, native federated types. Uh, it's a it's a great library, and uh, the TypeScript library is great as well. The native federated types is a little bit more versatile, so it'll give you the ability to use things outside of um, just Webpack. It's written a little differently. It is a great library. I'm just choosing the TypeScript one. They both work in a very similar way, though. So let's just kind of talk through the concept. Um, I had to just relink utilities here. Once I have it installed, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my um, my, my remote component. Uh, and I just have the NX kind of uh, workaround here commented out, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, import the uh, federated uh, types plugin. And this comes from that, that module that we just installed there. So um, let's see here, module. Federation TypeScript. So the uh, Federated Types plugin is basically just going to be uh, just a normal Webpack plugin. So in my case, in NX, I'm just you know pushing pushing this instance in there. Um, I do have to pass it my module federation config, and the reason why it needs the module federation config is because it's going to look at your exposed modules and it's going to generate types for those. So I misspelled the property name here. It should be federation config. So at this point, when I build, I can check my output. And in my output here, I'll have a folder. This is the default folder name. I think you can customize it, um, but it's fine for me. So I've got MF types, and then I've got just all the various types that are associated to it that are exported. Now my component's very simple, so the type's not really Fancy, but it's better than a component any right now, just kind of for demonstration purposes. All right, so one thing you have to make sure is that your dev server has to be able to support the uh, static output path for these files. So I think by default, NX doesn't set a static asset path. Um, it could be 
uh, a configuration thing. So the important thing is to just make sure you go ahead and set it. And I believe if you come in and you set output, um, output path, serve my um, hero application just to see. So right now I don't have, um, you know, an application is just a very simple kind of shell app. Now, the types that it generates, um, one of the things it does is it generates this uh, types index file. And this types index file is something that is used as kind of the discovery mechanism. So this will actually port, um, or sorry, this will kind of map the types, you know, that, that are available for download. Um, so just kind of verifying that this comes up here uh, is usually good enough um, just to make sure that your, your dev server is working correctly. So now I'm going to go into my consuming application and I will basically just kind of copy this over. Now the thing to be aware of here is that I don't need the dev server because I'm not serving those types. Um, I'm going to come in and add the plugin, basically the same uh, configuration that I was using before. It's just leveraging my config, which is already separate. And you'll notice when I try to run it, it'll say that unable to download zero from remote types. Now, the way that, again, NX has the remotes here, it's a little bit different from, you know, your traditional configuration. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to come in here and I'm going to create. This is pretty much the same syntax that you would see um, with the uh, build time static remotes. I'm just going to give it the remotes object. Remember, it's taking in that module federation config. So it's the same, you know, the same typings. Uh, and I'm just going to tell it where to get the types from, right? So in a way, this is kind of nice because you could, you know, source control this. And if you have a particular URL with a particular version, you know, maybe you want to, you know, from the, the forensic perspective, uh, have that URL within your Webpack config. And if you do, then you know where those versions came from. So I'm going to go ahead and rerun it here. You'll see that it completes. And now in my repo, I'll actually have, you know, under my, my host folder, I'll have MF types and it'll have a folder called hero. And then it'll have all those types that it went and it downloaded, right? Well, we're not using them yet, but it, it's downloaded them for us. Now we need to let TypeScript know about them. So we'll go into uh, the TS config. It, it doesn't really matter which one here. We're going to add a, uh, a TypeScript paths, and we're just going to add an asterisk. And we are going to say that um, MF types asterisk maps uh, to here. So basically, we're just kind of importing everything. So one thing being in NX here, and this is just kind of a part of NX is um, our, at our, our base TS config at the root of our project, our base URL is configured up here. And this is just the way that I, I want to leave it at the moment. I don't want to change it. So everything is kind of relative within uh, or from that path. So since it's not resolving, if I go in here and I just kind of make it the fully qualified path, down kind of in my apps directory and then into my, my application, um, I can now go and I can resolve that type. So you'll notice here that it's no longer component any, it's actually a function returning a JSX element. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna comment this out because we are using the dynamic remote functionality. Now import remote, the, the syntax here is a little funky because it is assuming a default export. But if I come in here, so if I import from my type here, which is this um, product hero type, let's see, can I prefix it with type as well? I'm gonna come in here and I'm going to set my default to uh, type of uh, product hero type for now. And if I look, I'll see I have the correct typings now. So again, import remote, it is assuming that this is a default export. If it is not a default export, there is a way to handle that. You can come in here and um, you know grab the promise and resolve the name of your export here as well. 
Um, and then we're just going to go ahead and we'll leave this type here. Um, but again, this is coming from the actual MF types that we resolved. Um, and then we just have to map that over to the default property. So now uh, just you know rerunning everything. So everything comes up and works as we intended. So with TypeScript, the only thing to be aware is that um, you know if you are using explicit types, remember they are you know tied to the versions of um, your module, right? So you'll need to uh, be concerned about you know which URL am I pulling the types from, maybe which environment I'm pulling the types from, and when you version and you consume a new version, so if you are going through a configuration service, um, whether you have TypeScript or not, you just need to ensure that module compatibility, right? Is, you know, the uh, API of my module different, right? In this version versus the, the current version, is it compatible? Can I change it? Rolling it back? Um, those are all different considerations to make. So hopefully this video has been helpful. You know, the, the TypeScript configuration here, again, um, there's two different plugins for it. They're both very, very similar. This covers, you know, shared modules kind of at a high level. I will put in the documentation um, or in the description, the URLs for the, the module federation documentation. Um, I hope this has been helpful for you. Thank you.